one. It being 9 a.m., I'm going to call this meeting to order. Please stand for a moment of silence, followed by the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Any changes to the agenda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Just a note, a couple of things were handed out uh, for public information as well as for board. Uh, one was an update to item 5.9. There was an additional uh, recommended award, so that's highlighted in yellow on the copy. Uh, and then the second is that we do have in front of you a revised preliminary plat for Buck Run, and the staff will give a detailed description of the changes for the board when we get to that item. Okay, I notice 5.1 was also on our desk this morning. Was there some changes to that? Let me take a look here. Okay, that's just... Uh, uh, 5.1, the, yeah, the, the piece in front of your dais, actually, if you're looking at this packet, this okay, is just... no changes to this. No, this is just a copy of the RBA's okay. uh, short list. Sorry for the confusion. I, there is a there is a double typo. We weren't going to necessarily mention it because you don't have to change your agenda, but I just note for board, uh, item 2.6 and 2.5 are the same. Uh, 2.6 has no warrants. It just got double posted, so you don't have to, like, remove it from consent or eliminate okay. it. It's just... Okay. We did not amend our agenda. Is there a motion to approve this agenda? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the agenda as presented. Motion by Dolan. A second. Seconded by Foby. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Consent agenda. Any items to be pulled from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move the consent agenda. Motion by Danielski, seconded by Barant. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Announcements, did you, Mr. Messel? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. <clears throat> a couple of, uh, uh, three short announcements. Uh, first of all, with the board's permission, we would like to uh, schedule a special meeting for next Tuesday at 9 a.m. to consider uh, some of the CARES Act uh, grant requests. Uh, specifically, I think we'll have at least one nonprofit and several business requests that we're processing this week. Um, because at this point, that's the only item on the agenda, we would recommend that we just do a, a WebEx meeting, uh, although if uh, one or two of you want to come in for other business, we'll obviously accommodate that, but we expect it would be a short agenda. Uh, second, uh, just a note, if you're outside and you see uh, there's uh, some active construction going on, both on the roof and also some of the brickwork, so we're trying to get things buttoned up for winter uh, with several construction projects, and uh, so far it's been going well, but uh, if you do have any questions, Dan, I think can answer those as well. And then third and last, uh, just a note that the on-again, off-again, on-again, off-again special session is now looking like it will be on again with respect to a bonding bill. So things are starting to line up uh, that there's a distinct possibility that next week uh, the state legislature will meet uh, and uh, there appears that there may be a bonding and perhaps even a tax bill. So we are working again with respect to our two projects to make sure that they are in the final uh, draft. How many distinct possibilities and then it happens? Uh, we've had three or four now, so. I think we're up to eight now. I was going to so. say three or four might be a little light. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I haven't been paying close enough attention. <laughs> okay, are there any other announcements? Hearing none, we'll move on to our uh, open forum. Do we have anyone signed up for open forum here today? We do not have anybody signed up, Board Chair. Okay. 
We'll move on to our regular agenda. Item number one, annual well sampling. I believe that's Erica. Erica. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, board. Um, as stated in the RBA, we're requesting approval for the contract for services with Houston Engineering for the residential well sampling. We've typically conducted this uh, with board approval since about 2012. Okay. What are the wishes of the board? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the contract. I'll second. Motion by Dolan, seconded by Foby. Now, this is kind of our ongoing responsibility to make sure that the water is uh, is safe. So, further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number two, the cap on the uh, low-income septic grants. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning, commissioners. What we have before you this morning is we are requesting that the county board consider implementing a $5,000 maximum grant award for the low income septic grant. The county received notice in the last couple of weeks that we received an additional $40,000 for the 2021 um, grant season. In up to date, we've um, given out 23 grants and the grant average has been $4,100 per person or per household that has received the grant monies, and we've spent a total of $94,309 on grant funds for those different property owners. The county has only ever had one grant that exceeded $5,000. It was for $5,400, and we did not have a maximum amount at that time, so they did receive the full amount of the grant. The um, zoning office would like to see the most number of people be able to benefit from this program. The money that is um, given out goes directly to the septic installer. Once we receive the invoice, we do require two bids in order to um, ensure that we are trying to get the best price available, and we're asking for a $5,000 cap. Okay. Um, how much is in the program? We got an additional 40000 or is it 40000 we have 40000 total. What happens is if we don't spend the money each year, we receive a lot less money the next year. The very first year that we did this, um, I don't believe that we expended all of the money. And then the following year, we only received, I believe it was $1,800. And so the zoning office works very hard trying to publicize this and working with individuals to ensure that they meet the qualifications and to try to make sure that that money is expended so that we receive the maximum each year. And so this year we were awarded the maximum amount that the state will give out, which is forty thousand. I'm just curious if you uh, if you set the maximum, and then if you went through the year, and there was some monies left, were monies left, would it be possible to distribute them? Uh, because they would they'd actually hurt us for the next grant cycle. Mm -hmm. And if there was a need, someone had the larger need, would that be a possibility with this? Or I, My guess would be that would be up to the county board. Initially, when we started this program in 2017, the maximum amount that the county would um, give for grant funds was 25% of the cost. Once we did not expend all of that funds, then we took it back to the county board and it went up to 33% to try to ensure that we did expend that money. If we did get to the point maybe next spring or something where we hadn't spent the money that is available, you know, I would imagine that would be up to the county attorney maybe to give us some legal advice, but the county board could possibly say we could do a higher percent potentially. Okay. I think that's, uh, I think that's something we probably want to revisit, but for today, we're looking at setting a $5,000 cap. Question, Mr. Chair. Chair Dolan. This grant program, can can this be used in conjunction with our loan program, our septic loan program? Yes, and it has worked very well. Some people choose not to do that. Um, others, I work with Erica in our office, and we work to do both the loan and the grant with people when they want to do so. Okay. And what's our, I'm trying to recall what our, does anybody recall what our funding amount in the loan program is? We put more money into that this year, mm -hmm. didn't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it's all total, but we have about half of that 
Okay. About two hundred thousand dollars remaining in in the available loans, Mr. Chair. Okay. And that's a revolving type loan, so it replenishes as time goes on. Correct. So that's. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it, it, sometimes on these programs it gets confusing which one we're talking about. Yeah, so yeah, this is absolutely. the grant program, not the 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 loan, egg, the loan program, yeah. and they can be used together. So even though we'd set a cap here, there's still the availability to go beyond that cap utilizing the loan program. Correct. Right. Okay. The wishes of the board. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of <coughs> setting a maximum grant expenditure of 5,000 per property for the low-income septic grant program. The motion seconded by Barant. Further discussion? Just one more question, Mr. Chair. So when we work with homeowners, I'm assuming this happens, but um, in this situation, people that apply for this grant, we also talk to them about the loan program? Yes. Let them know that that's available. Yes. So we're communicating with them. Okay, thank you. Our goal is to get everybody septic updated. Mm -hmm. Correct. Updated yep. and we'll do whatever <laughs> we can with the resources we have to accomplish that. Mr. Chair, I'll just one one other comment. I know that um, with the um, planning department working on getting information out about this program, um, I'm I'm assuming that has been successful in the amount of applications that you have started to receive. Yeah, I believe we've done a very good job. It goes in our environmental educator um, several times a year. A lot of the septic designers and installers also know about it, so a lot of the word gets out that way that they inform their um, customers that this may be an option for them, so we get filtered in that way as well. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the designers and installers would be key to yep. get the word out. Yeah, and I think one thing to note, you know, setting this cap makes it so we could, there could potentially, without this cap, there could potentially be a project that comes in early in the year, utilizes the entire program, and then we have people throughout the year that really need some, to take some of the edge off and don't have access to any of it. So I think it's a, it's a smart thing to spread that. Also, Mr. Chair, we when we receive a notice of non-compliance, and our initial letter that goes out does advertise the availability of both the grant and the loan. So yeah. right away, when the homeowner learns that their septic system may may be non-compliant due to if, if they want to sell the property or they get a permit or something, and you're required to get a septic compliance, it's it's automatically in their very first letter that we send out. Yeah. Right. And Mr. Chair, I feel that with the low-income um, grant loan, that helps, like Mr. Um, Dolan said, take that edge off. But we also provide that other opportunity at that at that loan, revolving loan fund. So we're he really helping to get these things done as best we can. So I think this is a good move to get the most dollars out there as possible. Good. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, planning and zoning. Conditional use permit for the Langowskis. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Okay, these are the recommendations from the Planning <coughs> Advisory Commission meeting that took place on September 17th, where public hearings were held. First item is James and Charlene Langowski. They're requesting a conditional use permit for a personal storage structure. It's on lot 24, block one, Sleepy Oaks. It's also in Palmer Township in the Shoreland Residential Overlay District and the Shoreland Overlay District of um, Rush Lake. Planning Commission recommended approval with five conditions and the findings of fact that are listed in your packet. What are the wishes of the board? Mr. Chair, I'll move approving the conditional use permit for a personal storage structure with the following five conditions and findings of fact as recommended by the Planning Commission. Motion by Danielski. I'll second. Seconded by Phoebe. I just have, when, when, I, when I read the, the minutes of the meeting, I think there was some confusion on that property. There are covenants on those properties, but there is no homeowners association in it. Yeah, like there was some discussion bit, on that. A little bit confusing there, so. Any further discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay, the next item is Troy Powers, Professional Mechanical <coughs> Services. The owner is Eric Peterson, requesting a conditional use permit for office and light industry. This is at 19640 200th Avenue in Big Lake. It's in Big Lake Township on 4.6 acres in the commercial district, and it's within the shoreline district of Beulah Pond. Planning Commission recommended approval with the eight conditions and the findings of facts listed in your packet. Any questions on that? Is there any questions? And I did have a, um, one question, Mr. Chair. So um, when is the... Um, the um, pen going away then? Is there no longer going to be Peterson's towing operating out of that business? Is that going to dissolve or? I'm going to let Mark talk on that. Um, this was my application. So um, Peterson Towing is still operating from the site. Peterson Towing was sold, the company, and it's now being leased to another party. So they'll still be able to operate Peterson Towing as a separate CUP from this property. There was a old CUP for a catering business that has been yep. requested to be revoked, but Peterson Towing will continue to use the site uh, at least until their lease is up. Okay, I was just looking for that clarification. So the pen stays and everything. Yep. Then. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Anything else on this? Is there a motion to approve? Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion to approve the conditional use permit for the light industry office and light industry with the following eight conditions and findings of fact as recommended by our planning commission. Motion by Danielski. Is there a second? I'll second, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Dolan. Any further discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Our next item. Next item is Manthai Estates. The owner is Manthai Land LLC. They're requesting preliminary and final simple plot approval, which is one lot. This is in Lavonia Township on 35 acres in the General Rural District. Planning Commission recommended approval with the four conditions that are listed in your packet. Are there any questions? We have a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval with the four conditions. Motion by Foby. I'll second, Mr. Seconded Chair. Seconded by Dolan. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay, the, the next item, um, I think in your agenda they might have been flipped, but for this plat buck run, we need to do the EAW first. Um, they're requesting a decision on the EAW for a residential standard preliminary plat of buck run. This is 15 lots, which is the first phase. Um, you have to do an EAW if ultimately the whole property could be developed and it's over 80 acres. This is in Baldwin Township in the General Rural District and it's within um, a natural environment shoreline district of an unnamed lake. Planning Commission recommended a negative declaration for an environmental impact statement. So EAW is adequate, EIS is yeah, not. Yeah, a, neg a negative declaration means it's adequate. Mr. Chair, I'll move the negative declaration. Motion by Dolan. Second. I'll second. Seconded by Foby. Further discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay, so then the next item is the actual plat, Buck Run. Uh, the owners are Gregory and Karen Sumser. They're requesting preliminary plat approval for Buck Run, which is 15 lots. It's a standard plat, and it's um, within 38 acres. Oh, actually, it has an outlot with 38 acres. It's in Baldwin Township in the General Rural District. Um, this had had some discussion about lots 7 through 10. There was a drainage easement running right down the middle of all of them, so that was discussion. The drawings that were handed out to you, the lots did not change. But the grading and drainage changed partly because of that discussion. They moved some of the drainage easements. Um, also in the conditions, since that's been changed, condition nine would need to be removed because that was applying to that discussion with the drainage easements. 
um, Planning Commission recom recommended approval with the 11 conditions, which nine should go away, and, and then it would be 10 conditions. Um, last night, the township met. I haven't heard from them, so their township was recommending, or their township engineer was recommending approval of these new drawings. Any questions on that? Okay, so the motion will be with nine stricken, the conditions with with condition nine stricken. Yeah, so then there would be a total of 10 conditions, yeah. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair. Motion by Phoebe. I'll second. Seconded by Dolan. Mr. Messel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Just to give you three options here, you can move, move as moved and seconded and approve it. Uh, you could also, if, if the board is not comfortable, uh, potentially uh, table it till the special meeting next week if, if you want to hear definitely hear from the township. Uh, the third option is it is possible you could also uh, have the revised plat looked at by the Planning Commission next week and then brought back uh, at the next regular board meeting. So I just want to make clear you do have three options. Uh, moving today is completely fine as the motion second is, but uh, if the board is uncomfortable, we do have a couple of options. We would have to look at the 60-day rule to make sure that it complies or write a letter. Um, so the, just be aware you do have those options. Well, I think if the board is comfortable, uh, clearly the, the uh, most uh, expedient option would be to move forward with the motion in the second, and unless there was some signal from someone that we have an issue here, and I have heard none. I, I did um, have a conversation with the township clerk, and then I emailed them a couple times that if they did have any discussion contrary to what was happening here, I mailed them the new... Um, the conditions, and then I said, I, I've heard that your township engineer had approved it. I did ask them that if anything happened differently last night, that they make sure to email me last night or first thing this morning. So I'm pretty confident that they're okay with it. Yeah, and just, uh, I mean, all we shifted really are some easements, and I don't, I think more than anything, it just makes lots more buildable, so. And I think wasn't most of the conversation, excuse me, Mr. Chair, based around some of the driveway? It was. Um, there was early discussion that they didn't want driveways to come off of, um, I think it was 136, that they wanted to come off of an internal one, which didn't work with our rules because then one <coughs> of the lots wouldn't have enough frontage. Mm -hmm. So there was that discussion. They got um, that clarified. Yeah. And so the easement has been clarified and adjusted to... We're okay with it, and obviously. and and the four lots that front on, I believe it's 136, they are going to share driveways, so there'll only be two driveways between the four lots. Okay, so that's similar, like some of the County Road Five um, areas have those one driveway in, and then they split. Yeah, they put it on the property line. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor signify with an aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Presentation on Thriving Together. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, in the spring, amidst the COVID quarantine, um, a discussion had come up with, at our Bridges Collaborative which is our Children's Mental Health Collaborative, about what we can be doing to reach out to people in our community during COVID when, during a time when people are working from home, services are being delivered in a much different capacity and kids are doing schooling virtually. So this sparked a small work group, which consisted of individuals from Greater Minnesota Family Services, Public Health, Health and Human Services, um, the Safe Child Council, STIR, and the Substance Use Prevention Coalition along with the Bounce Back Project. So here today to talk about the social media campaign that came out of that work group is Melissa Pribble from Center Care and the Bounce Back Program. Good morning, board. Thank you for inviting me to kind of share with you what we're up to. Um, the STIR Committee, which is Stronger Together Inspiring Resilience, is really working on um, adding resilience to the communities in Sherburne County. 
collectively, there's many organizations that are represented there um, from our faith groups, our school districts in Becker, Big Lake, and Elk River. Um, there are, the hospital is represented, public health is represented, so lots of organizations that meet together on a monthly basis. And we put together uh, a Thriving Together campaign, which we're calling Create a Ripple. And we've been invited here this morning to just let you know um, how you can push this out to the, the um, people that are in your circles and just um, make it more widely known throughout the Sherburne County communities. And so you have been shared, I believe, a sheet that has eight different um, scripts, I guess, for lack of a better term, that were to kick off each week. So we have an eight-week campaign and um, with an intro week and a conclusion week, and in the middle, there are six weeks that are introducing a tool that can be used for resiliency. And those topics are things such as self-awareness, self-care, mindfulness, relationships, purpose, and adapting to change. We really thought that these would be um, great topics of, uh, of need during this time of our pandemic and civil unrest and different things that are happening in our communities. As a, as a way to give some tools for our general public to utilize. And our school districts are pushing out this information as well. Um, we are, our initial intent was to drive people to the stirmn.org website. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a wealth of information there and you'll see it on your screen. That's a website that we've um, utilized some funding from Bridges to really um, kind of kick up and, and really make it much more uh, rich in its offerings. And our Thrive Together campaign content is there, as well as a calming zone and virtual calming center, a place for resources that are utilized throughout the communities, as well as a calendar of events. And so this is a place, a repository of sorts, that all um, members of our communities uh, can visit. And, and there in the middle is our Create a Ripple campaign. So each week, uh, we're rolling out different information. So when you, um, this is the information that will show up on our social media channels. So on our Facebook page, as well as Instagram and, um, I'm sorry, uh, Twitter. And so on Mondays, there's a very uh, good routine to it. There's a message from one of our community members. We have a student involved. We have representatives from our school, the hospital's bounce back project, uh, pastors from our local churches, Rivers of Hope, Open Doors for Youth. And so Message Monday kicks off our week. And then we go into Thoughtful Tuesday, really giving people some information to ponder and, and learn more about. Um, we go into Wacky or Wisdom Wednesday and just trying to share uh, a piece of wisdom or something to laugh about. And then Thoughtful, or I'm sorry, to Take Action Thursday, really giving our members that call to action to really uh, incorporate this topic of the week into their lives as a way of making them um, and themselves more resilient as, long, as well as the people they may serve. And then funny or a festival Friday as a way to kind of wrap up the week in a, in a, on a great note, um, something that um, pushes that topic of resiliency just once more throughout the week. And if there's additional content, it may show up on our social media channels on Saturday and Sunday of that week. But we've had some great, um, great information and people kind of looking at our information throughout the last couple of weeks. We started on September 14th and we have reached, um, kind of looking at the analytics, um, anywhere from 30 to 1,006 people uh, any, on any of the message that we've shared, with an average being about 500 per day, uh, people looking at the content that we're um, pushing out. As well as those that like it or comment on it, we're having about an average of 30 to 90 a day. So we do have, we're driving people to the sites, people are taking notice, <coughs> and there's about 100 followers or so on these pages now, so we're just getting started. But we are seeing this as a future option too for our collective um, organizations to push out further campaigns. I know the SUP coalition here locally already has one in mind for our next uh, campaign endeavor in the spring perhaps. So um, as we get people to follow us, we, can, we'll, we really have a platform for pushing out information to our collective um, community members. So I wanna thank you for uh, the time to kind of introduce it to you this morning. And I um, thank uh, Commissioner Phoebe for the invite. And if you have any questions, I can sure answer those for you now. Are there any questions, uh, comments? Commissioner Phoebe? I'm <laughs> well, I can wait. I'll pause if there's any other comments. Anyone else? So I saw a brief uh, presentation <laughs> on this in SUP. SUP is uh, involved in this and a few other entities that I connect with with the county. And I know we do a lot of policy and uh, more of that at this table, but I thought it was worth 
the five minutes for us to pause and look at what's being put out there to support our people with mental health issues. Um, this time is unprecedented that we're all going through, and I believe that sometimes if we put our resources and our time into these entities, um, the benefits definitely outweigh the effort. So thanks for coming, Melissa. It's been great working with you on this and our staff here. So, Quick, quick question. So is STIR, is that a separate nonprofit? Is that just a kind of a heading title for a collective? What is it? Yes, it was a committee that um, formed of all of our local representation that wanted to look at bringing resilience forward in Sherburne County, and STIR became the name, Stronger Together Inspiring Resilience. Okay, so it's just it's a, it's a committee of multiple organizations. It's not its own entity at exactly. all. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to clarify that. So this thing is 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 pretty locally mm -hmm. driven, local. yeah. you know, I, and that's pretty, that's yeah. very commendable to be able to get it up and off the ground, and I think really important. Yeah. Yep. And it's good to see you, Melissa. Yes. And it's good to see you um, still working hard to make sure that um, we're providing the needed um, um, mental health ish discussions and help. I've worked with Melissa for many years through the um, um, hospital over in Monticello. Mm -hmm. And so it's great to see you. And um, this program just seems amazing. I'm very happy to. I've, I've already thought of a few people to um, make sure they get connected with it. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Good to see you as well. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Now we're going to move on to jail, county, special housing painting. Is that what we got here? Correct. The first one is a special housing HVAC upgrade project, and I did hand out something before the meeting with an addition. Uh, when we got the original bids back from A&P, they did miss the security electronics, so on Friday they emailed me that, so I did add it to the uh, revised RBA that was passed out. Uh, this was a project that was approved back in August as a CARES COVID-related project, and then on September 22nd, the board approved hiring a &P as the contract manager for this project, and now a &P is coming back with the suggested contractors to move forward with, and Commander Carr is here if there's any specific questions on the project itself. Okay, so the, uh, the first group of bids in our packet is all uh, HVAC contractors? Correct. They're separate projects, yep. And they're all separate projects, or, or these people are bidding on these projects? These people are bidding on the HVAC project, right. and the, the coding, special housing coding project is a separate project. Separate so I'm one. sorry if okay. I'm confusing who were, those. Who were the, uh, the bid winners then? It's probably here, and I didn't. Yeah, know. it's broken out by project. McDowell was the roof work. Thielen Heating was the mechanical. Okay, so the bidders that we have on our packet, that was all of one of the packages in the project that they bid on, so we're looking at the winning bidders for every package. Correct, and combined it was over 50000 so okay. it has to come back to the board. Okay, I'm, I'm with it now. With Thank it. you. That was a heavy lift. Yeah, no, it always is with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are the wishes of the board then? Or did you have more? Or? No, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the qualified low bidders for the jail special housing HVAC upgrade project. I'll second this. Motion by Phoebe, seconded by Dolan. Any further discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank okay, you. The next separate project was the jail county special housing painting contract. We did get two bids for that, and we are recommending a and as the low bid to move forward with on that project. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion. Motion by Danielski, seconded by Barrent. For the that, that is also a CARES-related project. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next, we'll move on to the weekly CARES projects, and we have a total of the under 50000 at $39,650. It's all in your packet. Wishes of the board? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of those funding requests. I'll second. Motion by Dolan, seconded by Danielski. 
All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed nay, motion carries. And we also had two requests that were over 50,000, so I've asked staff to come speak to those. And the first is the HHS on-base enhancements, and I think Lisa Holker is gonna speak to that one. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, so we're back with a revised request. Actually, we had previously gotten approval um, for 10,000 uh, to improve our EDMS system, our electronic document system, and the income maintenance units. This impacts three different income maintenance units. Um, we were looking for some increased efficiency, reduce some redundancy, provide better customer service, be able to fully support our staff when we're out remote working because of COVID. The initial number was three supervisors saying, these are the things that we want and need. It shouldn't be that involved. Um, we then sat down with our vendor to say, if you want X, Y, and Z, you have to do A, B, C, D, E through Z to get your system in a place where you can do those types of things. Um, so now we've had that full system review. So this is the actual um, optimization, the actual solution from them. Um, that came back at a, at a full 125. Uh, so this is the additional 115 on top of that uh, uh, that 10,000. So what this does, you have a big long summary in your packet, but in a nutshell, um, this allows us to fully support our three income maintenance units when they're out working remotely. Um, the previous workarounds that we had in our EDMS system to kind of backstop and double check things that didn't go where they were supposed to go. They don't work anymore when we have our staff out remote working because they're not here to kind of catch those flaws in the previous system. Um, this also gives us reporting capabilities that we didn't have before to be able to better monitor those staff when they're out working. Um, it gives our CCAP team a fully um, electronic system. They've kind of been half paper, half electronic, doesn't work when they're out remote working. So this gives them a full um, electronic system as well. Um, and one of the big things that we were looking for, it gives us the ability to prioritize um, EA documents. So in the hundreds of documents that we're getting in, um, this functionality will allow us to bring those EAs to the top. So when people have disconnects or evictions, we can identify those out of the hundreds of documents a lot easier than a client calling and saying, hey, I turned it in yesterday. How come you haven't processed it yet? Well, it's 200 documents down. Um, and then it gives us the security to lock down privileged cases so that if there are sensitive cases or employee cases. Um, so a lot of that functionality that we were able to work around when we were in office, we can't when we're remote working because of COVID, this does all of that. Um, so we've been managing multiple waivers with COVID um, and now we're kind of starting to see the expiration of some of those. So we're working in double research right now, trying to kind of make up for what was pushed. Um, we're expecting a few more of the waivers to expire an increase in emergency applications when the moratorium lifts. Uh, so this just puts us in a much better place to be able to fully support our staff and kind of have that accountability piece when they're out remote working. Happy to take any questions. There were a lot of answers in that report already. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to put it all up front. I think the nice part too, we were able to negotiate, um, you know, when you kind of a la carte it and say this, that, and the other thing, um, when, we, when we do all of this together and we can group it together in something like this, we were able to negotiate $22,000 in savings as well on the rate, save some kind of project admin time because we can run these concurrently um, together rather than having them piecemealed out in several different projects. You've done a great job covering it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bruce, did you have something? Uh, just a couple of things. Um, I, I think everybody knows what EA is, but that's the emergency assistance requests, which are very time sensitive. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. We all speak. <laughs> right. Sorry. Buzzword speak, right? <laughs> um, and then the second thing is uh, just to note that, you know, this has gone through your CARES committee, but it, it really is the double but for test. But for COVID, we wouldn't, you know, have this as such a high priority. And also, but for CARES funding, and therefore not COVID, we probably wouldn't be doing these upgrades because the workarounds were sufficient for the need at the time. But with the pandemic, it clearly has highlighted the need for these improvements. Okay. What are the wishes of the board? Mr. Chair, I'll move that request. Motion by Danielski, seconded by Barrett. Any further discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed nay. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next is a request by IT for countywide telecommuting, and I believe Brian is in the video room right now. 
Here he comes. Here he comes. Right. Made me nervous there. <laughs> Dan thought he'd have to do it. Love Dan doing IT presentations. <laughs> Thank, <you. laughs> Thank you, board, for reviewing our our requests. So the county departments got together and discussed the staffing needs that they have. Um, all of the departments have a number of staff on home on some sort of rotating schedule. Um, the equipment that was put into here would only be needed due to that staffing change because of COVID. Um, and they see um, you know, further equipment um, creating more laptops, adding some more keyboards, adding some more screens um, for our workers in their homes will help facilitate and improve county services um, during COVID and during that staff rotation in those locations. So that's what this request is. So thank you for entertaining this. Any questions? Hearing none, entertain a motion. I'll move approval, Mr. Chair. Motion by Commissioner Foby. I'll second, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Commissioner Dolan. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Those nay, motion carries. Thank you, Gordon. Right. Next up is the weekly business relief grant approvals, and I'm happy to report we've hit the 100 applicant threshold when you count a couple paper copies that we've got. Um, before you make a motion or discuss that. I did highlight one on the list this week. It's from the Patriot. And under our guidelines, you have to have everything in place and your business up and operating by March 1st. The Patriot actually took ownership in late June, early July, so they would not qualify under that threshold. However, they were just a continuation of an existing business, just an ownership change where existing employees kind of took over the company. So staff is recommending that for approval, but I did want to point that out that it's a little different than our other guidelines that we've followed moving forward, or in the past, sorry. So the total for these grant approvals is $159,989, and that does include the, the grant from the Patriot. So essentially, the, the Patriot was a, a purchase or a rebrand of the citizen, yeah. essentially. Correct. Yeah. It's a better way to, to say yes. it. Right, and, I, and I've, I've actually run into that question a couple times with a couple different businesses, not just this one, that have purchased existing businesses. I know Old Main changed hands real close to that that threshold as well. Monty's so Tropical Hideout. Yeah, was Monty's did as well. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Chair, I'll make that motion. Motion by Danielski. I'll second. Seconded by Barant. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. And commissioners, I did pass out our original business relief resolution earlier this morning with a couple things highlighted on the back. Uh, first, if you notice, we're at about 1.9 million in approvals. And if you count the ones that are in the hopper right now, we're between 2.1 and 2.2. So we are getting close to that original threshold. Now we did in the resolution put a minimum of 20%. So I just want to be certain that you guys are okay if we go over that 2.3 million that was originally dedicated to the program. What do you want on that? A head nod or a motion or I mean I think Jim, do you have a recommendation? We knew we'd get you to use old the school. microphone. That's old school, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Another year in law school, you'd have had that a little quicker. <laughs> Ouch. Um I I think in simple consensus is okay. Because I okay. Dan and I talked about this a little bit, but I would anticipate that as we come back, Dan does this regularly, but we'll continually update you as to where we're at in terms of both the total for this program and the total overall. Um, but we put a minimum 20% in there specifically, hope, essentially hopeful that we'd be able to go over. So yes. I think consensus is okay. Okay, thank you. And I think by consensus, do we have some agreement? Am I seeing heads go up and down or keep? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We want to get out as much as we yeah. can. Yeah. Okay. Good. We're good on that then. One, the next item, uh, is CMDC. We did have a contract with them to review our applications, and we are nearing that threshold of fifty thousand dollar max, and that is written right into the resolution. So I think we do need a motion of some kind on this one to allow us to go past that fifty thousand, perhaps up to seventy five, if we would be comfortable. Okay. With that. Motion to increase that con con agreement to seventy five thousand. 
I'll make that motion. Motion by Danielski. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Dolan. Further discussion? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. All right, the next item is the County CARES Act personnel reimbursement costs. This is a discussion we had last week. We did have several come to our risk assessment committee last week, and this is the first batch that we're recommending to the county commissioners for approval. We will have another batch next week too as staff continues to turn these in. Okay, is there a motion to approve? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the County CARES Act personnel reimbursement costs. Motion by Commissioner Dolan, second. I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Foby. Any questions for the discussion on this? All in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. And Bruce, did you have any not community support grants this week? Uh, thank you, standing Mr. item on the agenda. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Just a, a footnote on that last, uh, I think Dan had estimated we thought we may be reimbursing ourselves up to 1.1 million for personnel costs, and I think we'll probably get pretty close to that when we're all said and done. So uh, with respect to nonprofits, we do have one out for underwriting that we'll have back next week, I anticipate. We have another anywhere from two to five that are in the queue that I expect. So they're, they're coming in not as strongly as the business ones, but we are dealing with larger institutions. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll see that uh, continue here through the end of the month. Um, Dan and I have had some conversation, and perhaps next week at the special session, or more likely on the 20th of October, we'll have a conversation with you about uh, when to formally close these grant windows, just because we know there's going to be a significant amount of paperwork uh, probably the month of November uh, before uh, the, the entire program closes uh, on December 1st. So uh, expect on the 20th, we'll give you an update on where we're at in terms of expenditures, and that'll give us 10 more days to do a last final push with businesses and nonprofits here. Um, so as, as we track that, that's kind of what we're looking at. Just to expand on that, we did send out our first report, grant reports for the first two weeks of grants that were awarded way back in late August. I mean, we've, we've been going at CARES now for 13 weeks, if you can believe <laughs> that or not. And our total expenditures, if you look at what was included in the packet, we are over $7 million now. So that's, that's kind of the most updated number with everything that's been approved today. We're at over $7.1 in CARES expenditures. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our pandemic and county response. Are you ready to go, Amanda? Always. Good morning, commissioners. Um, just a quick situation summary for you. Statewide, we're at 104,799 COVID confirmed cases. That's an increase of 982 from the day prior and 2,083 deaths. Um, so yesterday saw the fifth straight day of numbers that were over uh, 1,000. Um, over the weekend, we reached a new high of 1,400 um, for a daily total. And the seven-day trend of active cases is at an all-time high, and again, this is statewide, of over 7,500. 7, uh, in Sherburne County, uh, you'll see your numbers here on the case overview. We are at 1,272 confirmed cases. Uh, 1,222 of those are off isolation. 78 hospitalized, 26 in the ICU, 15 deaths, and four long-term care facilities still. Uh, Keisha, do you want to pull up the PowerPoint, please? Oh, and by the way, you'll see uh, Elk River has now surpassed St. Cloud numbers uh, in terms of total, the most cases by city. So. Um, so this was our um, COVID, this is the information that we provide to superintendents. Um, and so this is just, again, the school data. Um, the interviews have gotten long um, and the report uh, spreadsheet really captures any and all information. So if you can make it through the very long spreadsheet, um, you're able to glean quite a bit of information. So what we um, gave to our superintendents, since uh, the schools are definitely seeing cases uh, in their work settings, is that um, those um, interviews, case interviews, as of Friday that identified uh, K through 12 Sherburne County Schools as a primary work setting, nine cases, um, and 
for those for a secondary work setting, meaning they were probably um, somewhere else or community transmission that was, oh yeah, and I was here as just one case. Um, 10 cases had visited Sherburne County K through 12 schools in the last 14 days. Nine of those 10 were symptomatic, one was asymptomatic, and then four had a known contact with a case and six no known contact with a case. One was elementary age and four was high school age. And uh, just in terms of our case interviews, the extracurriculars that were impacted by those COVID cases were high school tennis, high school soccer, and cross country. And we weren't telling the superintendents any information they didn't already know. Next slide. So Amanda. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can we back up when you Absolutely. said Elk River has exceeded St. Cloud cases? Can our you clarify corner our corner of St. Cloud? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, yes ma I just want. Yep, I'm Saint sorry. Cloud. Yeah. Thank you. I speaking just, only with my Sherburne County hat. Yes. 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 So just, and then obviously and the, the prison numbers were impacted, and that makes sense. Elk River's you know our largest city in the county, and so it just makes sense. But mm -hmm. um, something that we thought was noteworthy. So was, do you think that was related to the school? The school starting or separate? Well, no, uh, no. Uh, we really do look at our cases daily. We try to spot trends, workplace trends, school trends. Um, they're really all over the board. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Mr. Chair, Keisha, can you back up a slide? So I, I just want to look at those sitting. The there. dashboard. The dashboard again. Thanks. Just to those. I'm gonna make that cases larger. by city. The cases by city, Keisha. Uh, bottom right hand corner. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. There you go. Make it. Yep. And that part, that St. Cloud is just our portion of Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay. Got it. Same with Princeton. Princeton. That's awesome. our. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if you want to go back on the PowerPoint, Keisha. Um, so then this uh, is also something we've been tracking. I've been reporting out on um, countywide community spread, but again, the more information we have, the more we're able to kind of uh, extrapolate because we have a better, better pool of information. So we've been tracking community spread. Community spread in Sherburne County overall is about 60%, meaning um, folks are unsure of where they got COVID. It was uh, not necessarily a school or healthcare setting or they had uh, contact with a confirmed case. And so you'll see here the different percentages um, on community spread based on our case investigation and contact tracing interviews. Where am I? Oh, I haven't turned it on. Sorry about that. It wouldn't be as good as the technology. Um, and so for uh, on Thursday's release of information, Sherburne County had a 14-day rolling average of 14.37. Um, we are projecting, and I'm using Friday's information, but actually uh, yesterday uh, we're projecting next week 16.30. So again, that's slightly different than what you see. Um, and again, these are specimen collection dates, so that very possibly could go up, um, though probably not a lot. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is, um, particularly in the last two weeks, as we've been tracking our 14-day rolling average, because that impacts the schools and a number of our schools cross county lines, um, we're also looking at our surrounding counties and what their averages are. Um, so Stearns County is now at a 25.83. Benton County uh, just surpassed the 20 mark, so they're at 20.36. Mille Lacs uh, is at 10.88, Isanti's at 17.7, Anoka County's at 20.78, and Wright County's at 11.98. So all of our surrounding counties are in that first, or I'm sorry, second tier learning style, and now a few of them are approaching that third tier learning style, and that third tier learning style again is um, when elementary switches to hybrid as well. So and we're that's trying when to they bump over 20. Right? Is yeah. it 20 that's yes, special? yes, sir. Yep. 20. And then um, again, what's kind of been a consistent thread started with um, Dr. Bittman at ISD 728. Now I've heard it from a few different school districts is once you cross that 20 mark, it's not an immediate changeover, it's three data points. Okay. So, Amanda, when you say the Stearns County is at, what did you say, 25? 25.83. 
I believe they're all in hybrid already, if I'm not mistaken. Does Did they anyone? go to hybrid already? I, th I think they started off the school year. Does anybody else know? I'm pretty sure um, the St. Cloud Public Schools um, started off in hybrid, but I could be mistaken. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know. I'm in that district. Uh, and again, this is that daily uh, rolling two-week average. So again, the numbers uh, on the far right is usually when we see kind of upticks. Um, but it's nice to have that daily point, too. So. Um, just so you're aware, um, we have been contacted, I think I told you a week or two ago that we were um, contacted by the Commerce Department um, on a uh, semi-permanent site up in St. Cloud. That's still in the works and I believe is coming uh, mid-October. This is one of 10 semi-permanent testing sites that the state is um, putting up throughout the state. Um, and then if you've, pay, if you've seen on the news, um, it's kind of the state's goal to also be doing six community testing sites per week. Um, so we were notified late last week that there's going to be a testing event October 13th through the 15th, again in the St. Cloud area. Local public health has been asked to assist the state with that. Uh, we are in a supporting role to MDH. So the state has hired a third party vendor to work on staffing and logistics. The National Guard will be actually staffing the event with MDH uh, and local public health has been asked to help um, welcome greet, uh, help with registration because the state uh, has, has their own lessons learned and so they think it's really important that they have community representatives um, kind of as that, that first point of entry. Securing a location has been extremely difficult for them. They've probably gone through a dozen different locations. There's some um, specific requirements that they have that it's a drive-through testing, uh, an open gymnasium, um, uh, just a big open space where traffic flow can be achieved and they also need restrooms uh, close um, and there's still no location secured. I think uh, every few hours or so I get another email saying, well, we think this will work. No, we think this will work. And again, um, right now I think they're just trying to secure a location and it's really the state working on this with Stearns County Emergency Management um, as the point. Um, we'll just be notified where that's at. So I'll be looking for marketing because uh, local public health has also been helped with marketing. Appointments are going to be requested for that event, but not um, required. And then lastly, kind of to your uh, earlier question, Commissioner Brandt, um, you know that we've been in uh, close contact with the schools. Um, the schools are getting hit hard and harder and harder every time we talk with them. Um, right now, it's really around staffing shortages. Um, there's a lot of contact tracing and close contact exposures going on in the schools right now. Um, again, the more information we have, the more we're able to do that contact tracing, kind of the, the more we're able to uncover. It's really not happening school transmission within the school. It's really happening community spread coming into the school. So uh, kind of to that earlier slide on community transmission numbers, um, one school district in particular just had a conference call yesterday at two o'clock with local public health um, and they said that their sub list is dry now. So if they have one more um, uh, teacher call in sick, they'll have to close down the school. Um, and so we have two school districts in particular that are kind of at that breaking point where they may be forced to um, implement distance learning, um, not because they cross a threshold, but because they have no other staff or substitute teachers to put in those schools. Local public health is continuing to have a very active role in that. Um, we have uh, both kind of our, our generalist, so Cody, who you've met, and Allison, um, doing the phone calls, doing the day-to-day -day support of the school administrators, and we've also signed a public health nurse, each school district, to help with that exposure and then that close contact assessment. And then um, on Friday's call, we also have offered up uh, a public health staff member to um, kind of do a walkthrough of the school. So really uh, exposure assessment, if you will. So preventatively, how else can we mitigate? Are you using the MDH best practices in terms of cohorting students um, six feet apart, um, really minimizing 
the, the, the folks who are interacting with the different student groups because that's going to have ripple effects when there's quarantines that occur. So um, that continues to be a very active um, part that local public health has to play. So, And that's my report. Does anybody have any questions? Amanda, would I be right to assume when you, the teacher shortage isn't necessarily because so many teachers are sick, but they get exposed and then have to quarantine, I would imagine? Well, uh, a little bit of both. Um, they've either been sick, they've had uh, exposure where they now have to 14-day quarantine, or members in their household um, are being, being sick or are also under the quarantine. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Amanda, is my impression that from what I've been hearing, like if a um, person calls in for their student who has symptoms of, you know, a lot of times this time of year brings in mm -hmm. more of the allergy-related yep. symptoms. Yep. But if they're coughing or if they're running a slight fever, then it's my impression that they cannot come back for 10 Correct. days. Correct. Absent, Even a though absent a negative COVID test. Um, if you remember the school decision-making tree that um, I projected up here a few weeks ago, that has not changed. And so the guidance says if you have one of the common symptoms or two of the less common symptoms, um, the only way you can kind of get out of that 10-day quarantine is if you have a negative COVID test. Now, that said, that's the guidance from MDH that's been remained unchanged, but uh, I also have been hearing different interpretations of that guidance, both with teachers as well as um, healthcare professionals. We are tr really trying to um, push out. We have this health advisory network, which is the clinics, and we've really just been trying to push out the correct MDH guidance even to the clinics and folks getting the tests because folks are getting different information from all different sources. Yeah, okay. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the guidance gets really hard to follow for people, and they almost are traumatized by the effect that they might have if they call in and say their youngster has a little fever. Mm -hmm. Which is and not uncommon. And it's just uncommon. the cascading effect of that, how that affects them, their employment, and all yes, the way down the absolutely. line. Absolutely. Uh, hopefully, we are able to, to, to keep working with this so that people are continue to be compliant mm -hmm. because uh, there's going to be the idea that, well, maybe Johnny does have a fever, but we probably better send him off to school because I can't miss where this can not happen here. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it is a, it's a tough position for everyone. Well, a lot of times kids just do that. I mean, fevers are not uncommon. They can be one day and yeah. on the next. Oh, uh, Commissioner Brown. And just Sorry. a question about the fever issue. Do schools require that children have parents check their temperature in the morning before they go to school and report if they have a fever, or is that done at the school? So my understanding um, from our Sherburne County schools is it's a symptom checker at home. Uh, that decision-making tree is for schools and child care centers. So my personal experience is when I drop my two off, they are screened at the school, yeah. but um, our school districts do not have that capability, and so parents are asked to do that at home. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Messel. Uh, just two things to follow up on the administrative issues, uh, and Amanda can help me here. Uh, first of all is uh, we were not able to secure 15 uh, participants in the YMCA daycare program, uh, so at this point uh, we will be ending that program here in the next uh, several days. Uh, obviously, if we find a need changes, we'll go back to the Y and see if we can make that work, but we really do appreciate uh, the board's support for that effort and also the YMCA's incredible flexibility to try to make that work for our staff. Uh, we did also broaden that to other employers in the area to try to meet the 15 uh, student threshold, and again, we just were not successful. Um, Second of all is there is some discussion uh, going on in counties about uh, restarting emergency operation centers. Um, really, it's being done for a couple of reasons. One is, is uh, uh, where there's mass testing going on. Um, there's a logistical requirement, and that's been helpful. And the other one is in anticipation of mass vaccinations in the future. Um, we'll monitor that here within our own EOC. Uh, starting it up doesn't necessarily mean 24-7 staffing. Uh, and as you know, we haven't uh, really addressed or used the Unified Command now for several uh, weeks, almost a couple months, simply because the board has been meeting weekly and we haven't had a need for it. 
Um, but I'll monitor that, and, and obviously, uh, the, the you know the chair is involved in those decisions. And if we do uh, reactivate the EOC, we'll be in communication with you. I'm. Uh, what are Amanda? Do you have any numbers on how many you know the folks that are sick in Sherburne County? How many of them end up in the hospital or ICU? I mean, those numbers have uh, not not followed the trend of positive cases in this state that I can tell. <laughs> You're correct, and uh, as I reported last week or the week prior, uh, statewide, they're not, they're reporting it differently now um, in aggregate versus a daily uh, count. Um, one thing that I didn't mention because it really, I haven't heard it from any MDH sources, but two of our different public health staff, one had a father hospitalized at Mercy and one um, just went in for their clinic at Fairview Princeton, said the hospitals are full. The, the gal said she was actually turned away from Mercy and had to go to Unity and Fairview Princeton is, they're, they're full. And that's something I haven't heard before, but again, kind of on two different days within the same week. Um, so I don't have an answer for you. Um, I haven't heard any officially, but. I just know when I get the update, I go through and from uh, MDH and I open it up. I go to today's stuff. First of all, I take a look at uh, uh, how many people have passed away and, mm -hmm. and get that number. Then I go, go through and open up hospitalizations. Well, hospitalizations, the way that opens up for me, and it's probably different, is it starts from day one yeah, and it's a cumulative, mm -hmm. and you've got to go all the way to the bottom of that, and then you can find how many were hospitalized that day. Uh, and it, the number really has been going down, and I think that's because treatments are so much better. But at any rate, that so the rising cases is not does not necessarily mean we have more people in hospitals, and actually livability is better at this point, the way it seems their uh, patients are doing better with this. COVID, correct? I think you could spin the story however you want. I've heard it both ways. And I'm not saying you are a commissioner. Please uh, don't take it that way. Um, I, again, I think it's depending <laughs> where you get the news and whatnot. Um, I mean, this is off of MDH's website. Yes, yes, that's I mean, correct. I, I'm, but not, I, I, I'm not quoting an unnamed news no, source. No, 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 no. <laughs> MDH's website. Yes, and again, I think we're very fortunate that hospitals and ICUs, and also while the hospitalization and ICUs um, have been down, um, the capacity has increased, um, and, and that information is also available on MDH. I think that it's just, it's still important to note that um, you know the community spread is high, the numbers are high, it's still a serious disease, and to your earlier point, Commissioner, um, even if uh, you know I come down with it, you know, my whole family's still out for 14 to 24 right. days, you know, and so I think um, there's different aspects of this beyond hospitalizations, ICUs, but it, it is a good news story um, that we haven't seen that at rise as well. Okay. Any other question? Do you ever feel like you're trying to get on the Supreme Court? No. <laughs> Just waiting in anticipation on what question is coming next. <laughs> Okay, is there anything else for Amanda today? Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, did you have more or are you? Okay. We'll move on to Commissioner Correspondence. Who would like to start us off? I can start, Mr. Chair. Um, I had special board meeting. Um, the Excel Energy Community Meeting um, virtually. Um, uh, Central Mississippi River Regional Planning Partnership uh, meeting in that uh, uh, executive committee as well. And then our county township, uh, county townships CARES meeting uh, last week to um, see where our counties were at as far as the utilization of their funds. and. That had really good attendance. I, I was impressed with the amount of people that showed up for that. So, again. Okay. Brianne, do you? Okay. Um, 
had the Connexus Energy Zoom meeting, um, attended the MCIU meeting on the 23rd, on the 24th, the North Star Line meeting um, by Zoom that I attended with Commissioner Schmeezing, the 28th, my options meeting, special board meeting on the 29th, um, did a chamber um, dinner meeting in Big Lake and did the presentation for the framework 2030 to the um, chamber group. October 1st, the Minnesota Regional Transportation Forum. Also attended the Minnesota Public Transit Conference, which I'm doing right now. It's a Monday through um, Wednesday conference. I'm doing it virtually. Um, the actual conference is happening down in Rochester. But my first day was yesterday, and when I get done here, I'll be popping into some um, meetings throughout the day with that. Also attended the Township CARES meeting by um, phone, and also attended the same uh, CMRP meeting as Commissioner Dolan. I think that's it. Commissioner Foby? Um, uh, attended the XL Energy Community meeting on the 23rd. On the 24th, I had an AMC Futures uh, meeting, which was called Getting Beyond the Bumpiness, uh, Conversations About Race and Differences. Um, that same day, I had a Rum River, One Watershed, One Plan meeting. On the 29th, we had a special board meeting. The 30th, the Township Association meeting. On the 1st, East Central Regional Juvenile Center meeting, and last night I had a Princeton Airport meeting, and the Airport uh, Advisory Council is inviting all of you, including some of our staff, our Planning Commission, our Economic Development Authority, to an, a kind of an open house at the Princeton Airport on October 22nd from noon to 2, just so they can highlight who they are and what they do. Um, and then if you're up in that area, feel free to peek at the new solar garden right next to it um, at Prairie Restoration. So I invite you all up. Let me know if you're coming. Pack an overnight bag, of course. <laughs> um, but come and visit us up in that neck of the woods on the 22nd. Um, and then a few other things I just want to mention have been in conversation messaging with uh, messages going back and forth, like I said earlier before the meeting with Great River Family Promise who is the organization that addresses homelessness in Sherburne County, their doors will be closing at the end of the year. Um, so just to note that, and then also with the announcement of Fairview's um, reorganization and cuts, uh, the Zimmerman Clinic is going to be closing as well as the Malacca Clinic up in my area. And just wanted to note that. <laughs> Barbara? Yeah, on the 23rd, I was at the Excel Energy. I listened in on that to their breakfast. Um, on the 25th, we had our first steps joint power meeting um, with our different counties that worked together on that area. On the 29th, we had a special board meeting. And on the 30th, uh, I participated in the Minnesota Healthy Partnership, um, had a, a webinar about policy review tool that they'd like to have us use uh, to review policies in each of the participants' um, counties to look to see if um, some of the topic areas that are considered important, that, which include racism and some other things, are addressed in some of those policies. And then I went to the uh, Township Association meeting that evening um, on the first um, I was at the IEIC meeting, which is for early childhood family ed and other programs for young children. And then on the Monday the 2nd, I listened in on, I mean on the 5th, I listened in on um, the webinar about racism that the Healthy Partnership Group is, was sponsoring. And then to course today's meetings. Okay. Uh Mike, executive committee meeting on the 30th. Uh, 
We are, if you folks uh, happen to bump into, I think, Wright County, some of those, they may have some interest in, in participating with MICA, and I think they'd be a good fit for us. Uh, Chisago County may be a good fit as well. I think they have some interest. So if you're out and you bump into those folks, just kind of mention to them, and they certainly are welcome to come and join us. Uh, in Wright County's case, they have uh, some of their staff is already paying to be participate with other staff in MICA, so it might be a pretty natural move for them. So uh, if we create a little energy around that, that would be helpful. That afternoon, we had a North Star Community Funders discussion. Uh, you know, they're down to one trip, uh, two trips in and out a day, and the numbers are are very poor, uh, so the uh, discussion is how long do we keep going? Is there a possibility that we may uh, stop service for a while? So there's a lot of lot of discussion going on in, with, with North Star and the future of North Star is going to have to be part of that discussion. Uh, we have some issues that are related to COVID with what's happened with North Star, people working from home. We also have some changes in our city that kind of change the uh, the thoughts and if people want to work down there and, and participate down there. So hopefully that comes back quickly and people are excited about being being there. But there's a couple things going on there, so th that discussion is going to be ongoing. Uh, let's see. Then on Friday, I spent the uh, entire day here in a settlement conference that uh, we didn't get settled, so, but we had a lot of good discussion. I think attorneys call settlement conferences, uh, Mr. Syme can help me with this, do they call that trial prep? Is that another name for it? So, but at any rate, we didn't, uh, we didn't get, we were unable to get He's it settled. speechless so again. We'll go on. Uh, and that's all that I have. So our agenda is complete. This meeting is adjourned.